Hello everyone, good morning. Let's go for a drive and talk. <clears throat> Let's go for a drive and talk. Beautiful day today, beautiful day today, so beautiful, so, so nice. As I was parked out the front of the shop, some farmer behind me came up to me as I, was, I had the door open and he said to me, you said to me, you're right down on one side. Whether it's your tire or, or the spring or something, maybe get someone to have a look at it. I went and I had a look at it myself, I couldn't see any problem, but I'll check it out later on in further detail. Maybe one of the springs has failed or something. <clears throat> you never know, you never know. I, I put this car through such, you know, adverse condition driving that it wouldn't be surprising if there was another problem that had cropped up. But basically I've been rejuvenating the car so much. I've been fixing the car so much. I'm going to a town right now to get some stuff to, to enable me to uh, replace the brake rotors and the brake pads. I've already got the rotors, I've already got the pads. I'm going to town on Thursday to get the air conditioning done. They're going to put in the refrigerant gas into the air conditioning. And uh, I've fixed up the AC compressor, I've changed the drive belt, I've changed the drive belt tensioner. I've fixed the dent in the front in the front left panel. I've replaced all the tires, so the tires are brand new. I've fixed a crack in the windscreen from a truck. I've done so much. I've even put the the, the windscreen cleaner fluid in the reservoir for that, that detergent fluid. I've done a lot of stuff for this car, and it's registered. <laughs> On top of everything, it's registered. You know, so. so I've been up keeping this car. You know, I've been on a, on a kick lately of fixing this car, basically. And it's coming to fruition now. I've got these beautiful made in Italy brake discs, these rotors as they're called. And I've got the, 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 the brake pads. I don't know where they're made, like in Austria or somewhere. The, the, the replacement panel for this was made in Austria. So there's parts from all over the place for this. Yeah, so. Is there a problem with the back suspension? I don't think so, but that's what he was sort of saying. It was an interesting thing that he said there. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so what am I doing? I'm going to town to just get a few odds and ends that's like, when, you, when you're replacing the brake discs and the brake pads, there's certain consumables that you need for it, such as you need, um, brake cleaner as a spray can Psh, spray can of brake brake cleaner you need a spray can with some kind of um, lubricant some kind of grease on there and the ones that they were using were silicon grease on on YouTube videos so I'm gonna get try and get some silicone grease or lithium grease or something some kind of grease you need grease for where you've got metal on metal contact with the brakes so yeah I've got these beautiful brake discs and the brake pads and everything there's a tool that you you don't totally need it you can get by with other things but I'm gonna get the tool it's it's on special it's $18 at super cheap auto there's $18 it's this tool that you the the brake calipers the, the brake pistons or cylinders they're extended outwards because your brake pads are so thin and you're gonna put in really thick brand new brake pads in there so you've got to push it back in and to push back in the, the, the piston, the brake caliper, you, you, you can't really do it by hand, it's too difficult. So you need a tool to do that, that you wind it up. You put the tool in place and you wind it up and it pushes the, 
hydraulics back into the into the um, into the cylinder. So uh, it's 18 bucks. So I'll get that, and then it should be about a three-hour job to change over the both of them, by both sides of the front of the car, both front brakes, and then I'll have nice brakes, and that's going to be great. You're supposed to change over those brakes at like 100,000 k's or something, and I've got 150,000 k's on the car at the moment, so it's a bit bloody overdue for the brakes. They're still good, they still work, but they're so down to their fine last bits that, you know, they're squeaking as I stop and stuff like that, so I've gotten good good mileage out of my brakes. I don't, I'm very nice on my brakes. I don't, I don't use the brakes very much. I'm, I'm kind to my car in that sense. I drive kindly to my car. So that's one of the reasons why it's lasted a long time. So, well, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. And as you can see, I'm pretty happy. It's not like I'm... There's been Valentine's Days in the last few years where I've been in a kind of a love sickness. Do you know what love sickness is? It's like a full-on... You, you're so down from love sickness. There's been times where I've been lovesick. Well, not not last Valentine's and not this Valentine's. So, so uh, I'm basically moving on with my life from all of this narcissistic romance scam that I've been enmeshed in the last couple of years I'm moving on with my life 2024 is not going to be is not going to be a year for me of narcissistic obsession I know some of my viewers were upset at me for being like sort of like sort of like I don't know what you see here I don't know I don't know what you're getting out of this well I with the whole narcissism battle that I was in well I was getting something out of it for sure I was finding myself I was getting real strong value out of it even though it was extremely painful so but the only one in some kind of romance with a narcissist the only one it's not a relationship, it's an addiction ship. Addiction. In such a duo, the only one who actually moves on, the only one who actually discards the other, who actually they say that narcissists devalue and discard you, that's true, but then they come back again and they hoover you and they begin the cycle again. The only time they won't come back is if you fully mortify them. I wasn't able to fully mortify this one, it seems, so they just kept coming back. So, um, the only one that actually does the, the final discard is the target of the narcissist when they truly walk away. And you know, it might seem like what's the big deal for, if you're looking at this as a third party observer from the outside, it'd be like, well, what's the big deal? Just walk away. You don't understand. We're talking about the realm of spiritual warfare, first of all, and we're talking about the realm of addiction and dependency. And it's a bit like saying to someone who's on um, heroin, to the target of a narcissist, just, just walk away from your narcissistic romance interest. It's like saying to an addict of heroin, just walk away from heroin. It, to, to get off of this drug, it's, it's understandably, it's, it's, you know, what is it to get off of heroin? Is, isn't it like just, like, I mean, look at the lead singer of um, Alice in Chains. Remember that, that guy, Alice in Chains lead singer? Can't quite remember his name right now. Lane Staley. Lane Staley, what a cool dude. He could really sing and he was cool. He looked good. Lane Staley basically died of, I think, heroin overdose. Hero Long-term heroin usage. He got onto heroin, I think it was heroin, and then the heroin just basically sucked the life out of him. You know that final photo of Nikola Tesla where he looks so thin and bony when he's like 80 years old or something in like 1946 or something? Well, um, that's what Lane Staley looked like just before he died. Like the heroin had turned him into a skeleton. He'd become like a depraved, 
fiendish, ghoulish skeleton from his heroine. And this is in like 2001 or something. <clears throat> and he died from the heroin. <clears throat> so what was my point there? <laughs> my point there is that this is, this is an allegory of a romance with a narcissist. The target will slowly, slowly become Gollum-esque from all of the life force energy, the vril, the, the psyche drive, the object libido being sucked out of them by the energy vampire narcissist and so yeah just walk away brah it's easy just walk away you don't understand you're dealing with an addiction you're dealing with an addiction you're dealing with an addiction so pretty hot today so I'll get my aircon fixed soon it's only 10 30 in the morning and it's already 29 and a half degrees and we're very high up in the mountains here so it's going to be hot down down at sea level it's going to be hot I'm wearing my beach shorts today it's that hot I could even go to the beach today I need to keep some cool air coming in, but I need it to not be so noisy that you can't hear what I'm saying. Although the mic is in a pretty good position right here, I think, so that's good. <clears throat> uh, beautiful day. So I woke up this morning and I sent a message to the to two of the sock accounts, two of the alias accounts of this narcissist that I've been embroiled with in this romance scam that's been sucking all the life energy out of me. I woke up this morning. I didn't even think that it was Valentine's Day tomorrow. I didn't even think that. I just woke up this morning. I was totally unaware that it was Valentine's. I'd forgotten about it. <clears throat> I sent some kind of final message and I basically said, listen, all I got out of this addiction ship with you is pain. And I'm sure that you had lots of fun from me. And like I said in the beginning, I wanted to talk face to face. And if you want to do that, my door is always open. But starting from next week, I'm going to block all of your alias accounts so that I can't see anything if you try and type something to me. If you try and type a dog whistle to me, I won't see it. I've already, I've already made it so I can't see you on Discord. I've already started blocking you here and there. And start of, starting next week, I'm blocking all of your alias accounts. I'm not gonna be able to see your, your dog whistles And so just know that you can dog whistle as much as you want, but I'm not going to see it. And if, if by some chance I see some dog whistle from you, I'm going to block and ignore that as well. So I said to her, like, listen, I wanted to speak to you face to face. Don't come back to me unless it's for that. Otherwise, we're through. That's what I said. I, I copy pasted the message to two of her alias accounts. 
and I mean it. I'm gonna del I'm gonna hide on my channel so those comments are not visible to my YouTube channel anymore. All of her alias accounts, of which she has like six. So the end result of this is going to be that 2024 onwards is going to be narcissist free for me. I spent 2023 and 22 intensely involved in all of this stuff with this narcissist. A lot of my videos were about it. I've gotten everything out of that that I can get out of it. From that I got, I gained a lot of stuff. I gained awareness of codependency, I gained awareness of childhood complex post-traumatic stress disorder from abandonment, uh, from ne neglect, from, from emotional neglect. These concepts are so new to me, it still takes me a while to think of that phrase, emotional neglect. That's enough to, in early childhood, that's enough to screw you up completely for the rest of your life unless you can figure out, figure out a way to change things. Which is what I've been doing since mid midway through 2023. Got a nice cool iced coffee here. nice and cool <clears throat> I'm also going to get a new flathead screwdriver in town today a big one quite a big one get that from the hardware store from Bunnings So, you know, what I've just discussed, it may not seem like very much to some of you, but that's a big, it's a big step for me. For me to try and break free of the addiction to a narcissist is a huge step. It's a bit like a heroin addict announcing, you know what, in 2024, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to give up the addiction to heroin. I'll make some changes this year. We're already into the second month of the year too. The year's going fast. It's going really fast. God, some people are incredibly slow drivers. Oh. I have more things to talk about, but just listen, like the, the gravity of what I've just said, you know. The narcissist puts, they, they invite you in to a thing called a shared fantasy. It's a lot easier to get into one than it is to get out of one. And what I'm fixing to do in 24 is to get out of the shared fantasy. <clears throat> I 
And like I said, the final discard is not actually in the hands of the narcissist. They basically never do the final discard. The one who does the final discard is the the codependent, the target, the 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 romance interest of the narcissist, or the, or the you know whoever you are to the narcissist. You're the one. If you're the target of them, you're the one that does the final discard. You have the capacity much more than they do to to find to put some finality and to walk away because they never walk away. They keep a harem of sources of supply and they want you you're valuable to them as a source of sadistic supply uh, for example and so they'll 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 distance themselves from you periodically and then they'll come back again and, and restart the process and they'll hoover you again but that's not really discard that's like temporary discard you can discard a narcissist I've done it before One of the benefits of, of being in any kind of relationship with a narcissist is someone like me is worried about breaking the heart of someone else. Well, with narcissists, you don't have to worry about breaking their heart because they don't have one. They, listen, they don't have a heart. So you can't break their heart. You can't break something that's not there. So this is going to sound perverse, but narcissists and like psychopaths and that, they like to be abused like like sexually for example they don't they don't mind uh, apparently this is what I've heard they don't mind rough sex they don't mind being abused they don't mind abusing other people and they don't mind being abused this is what I've heard <laughs> and in my own experience they certainly don't mind abusing other people that's for sure I can confirm that. But they live in darkness. Their, their, their landscape of their inner world is so different. Their experience of the world is so different than an empath's experience of the world. They live in darkness. There's constant uh, patterns in their speech and their communication that refer to darkness, that refer to things like devils, demons, Ghouls, witches, witchcraft. All of them have these constant, um, subtle, but ever-present patterns in their communication themes <clears throat> and symbolism and metaphoric expression. All, all of these narcissists, if you listen to them long enough, you can see these patterns where <clears throat> they're into witchcraft, they're into demons, they're into devils, they're into hell. They're into thr Friday the 13th. They're into monsters. They're into monsters. I am not... I, I'm telling you, this is 100% true. This is 100% true across the board. Across the board. They're into this kind of stuff. You'll see it. You'll see it. If you watch long enough, you'll see it. They have some subtle preoccupation with darkness. You'll see it in it manifests because it's their true self. It manifests in everything that they do and say. Like if you look at the music videos that they choose, for example, sometimes the music videos that they choose will have these kind of themes in them. You know desecrated churches um, witches on broomsticks and bats flying everywhere and, and people just the, the themes that, that appeal to them in music videos are the themes of a person who is struggling between light and dark and the dark has tentacle hooks on them and is always pulling them down and the dark is winning in the battle within them for dark and light, dark is always inexorably marching forward. 
and they are becoming darker and darker and darker. These are the kind of themes that if you look at the video clips that narcissists will watch or the, the lyrics that they're into or whatever, I'm telling you, they're the people of the darkness. All of them. Even if I, I was just thinking the other day about some of the paintings that my mother did, one of the last times that I was at her place, I saw the paintings. And, you know, she had lots of paintings that she did. And some of them, just looking at them now with fresh eyes, thinking back, you know, now that I know that she's a narcissist, and what were her paintings like, just thinking, yeah, these paintings basically express the inner world of a narcissist. If you look at it that way, it's not, it's not just all like trendy, avant-garde, sort of impressionist, sort of abstract, sort of uh trendy art no there's something going on here there's really something going on there So another thing is, that, God, it's hot in here. I've been thinking about um, a friend of mine who I knew when I was in high school. Sorry, I have to open the windows. So sweaty. Yeah, so, a friend of mine that I knew in high school, he's now a Qantas pilot, probably a captain. Back then, we were like 17 years old. I knew this guy for a few years in school, and I knew him after school as friends. The last time I saw him would have been in about 2010. We're still friends. I could still, I could still call him up tomorrow and have a chat. I might actually do that. So the main point I want to make is that he succeeded in launching into adulthood successfully and that I did not succeed in launching into adulthood successfully and I want to kind of um, so I know it's loud sorry about that I want to I want to sort of delve a little bit into my friends situation compared to mine and maybe sort of analyze why he was able to launch successfully into adulthood and why why I failed to launch because there's reasons there and it's worthwhile analyzing them so if I can figure all these reasons out then I can have a hope of actually relaunching myself this year in 2024 you know that movie it's I think it's called failure to launch I should actually probably go and watch it again. I think it's Owen Wilson and uh, that other guy. So um, Vince Vaughn, maybe is it Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn? <clears throat> Failure to launch, or maybe it's Adam Sandler. I don't know. Failure to launch. This movie about a guy who who's becomes an adult, but he doesn't sort of um, become an adult. You know. One of my greatest shames in my life, although I've actually got to wind back the shame because it is not my fault, is my failure to launch into adulthood. I still feel like I'm about 16 years old in terms of my emotional development on one side of my personality and in terms of, 
in terms of my life achievement in career, money, and uh, love, romance, sex, I feel like I'm, I'm about 16 years old. I'm 42, but I feel like I'm about 16 years old. I feel like I'm in a state of pause, a state of permanently arrested development, unless I can kind of snap out of it and, and change things. So this is really important to me. So my friend and I in high school, we're good friends. He managed to launch successfully and now he's a Qantas pilot and I think he's a captain by now. Me on the other hand, like he said to me, I see no problem, just keep flying. He said to me about me, I, he said to me, I don't see a problem, just keep flying. I had so many other issues on my mind back then. Really bad acne and other health problems. And um, I wanted to address these things. <clears throat> Looking back on it, the money needed for flying training, the availability of it in the end was not the problem that stopped me from flying. It was that I stopped, I gave up because I just had so many other things on my mind that were much more important than the flying. How could I possibly concentrate on the flying when I had all these acne scars to deal with? I had to get excision surgery on the acne scars. I had to get laser on the uh, fraxel laser on the acne scars. I had acne scars to deal with. I had all these problems to deal with. I had social problems to deal with, social anxiety. I'd never been able to socialize very much uh, in high school. I remember in high school, I remember there was a period of about six to eight months where no girl spoke to me in high school. I remembered thinking about it and going, my God, it's been like more than half a year and not a single girl in school has spoken to me in that whole fucking time is what I was thinking at the time. And this was about when I was 17 or something and the acne had just exploded on my fucking face. I mean, there was no, there was no casual chit chat from girls. They just didn't want to know me and I didn't want them to know me. I was like, I don't want, I don't want them to see me like this. I just wanted to hide. It was just such a horrible nightmare of an experience. And it was all because of uh, you get sick when you're, when, you're, when you're in proximity to a narcissist that's sucking the life energy out of you, the object libido. My mum was sucking the energy out of me and eventually I got sick and it manifested as really bad pimples. Really, really bad pimples. And if you think about it, pimples is probably like Really bad acne is probably like the body trying to excrete toxins out of the skin pores. So it's like the, the body's trying to get rid of toxicity. Metaphorically, it's like somebody around you is toxic and is filling you up with toxicity and your body is trying to excrete the toxicity and get it out of you. And that, metaphorically, that's the explanation for the acne. So... So I'm thinking of having another shot at getting getting back up on my horse and launching back into life. I've already done some kind of an ad hoc relaunching into life. I have launched, like you know, I've you know, um, in my in my 30s, I did a lot of hard work in 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 the workplace. I made a lot of money. I didn't make a lot of money. I made I had a job. I held down a job. I was productive. I had a mortgage or two. I uh, I paid my mortgage. I did smart things like I refinanced my mortgage to get it to get it on a lower interest rate. So I went from like an already pretty good rate of like six and a half percent or something down to like fucking uh, three and a half percent or something. I did really good moves with my mortgage. So the interest rate was low. I kept on paying my savings into my mortgage. So the equity was high. I, I renovated my apartment. I sold my apartment for a small profit. I bought a house. All these things. So, I, you know, in my 30s, I really got my shit together and I did a lot of things. And I've had a pause now and now I'm 42. I've had basically a pause for the last two years. And now I'm wanting to relaunch 
into adulthood as though I was 18 years old finishing high school me and my friend Andrew who's now Qantas captain you know he went on to just just launch so well and I, I, I'm, I'm remembering how me and him would catch up every so often as I was as we were sort of drifting apart in terms of where we were working and, and studying and stuff because we both went to the same university as well we both did the same university course as well <clears throat> he launched successfully into life and I didn't and I've over the last few days I've been in addition to all this Valentine's Day narcissist discard stuff that I've been contemplating I've been analyzing why Andrew succeeded in becoming a Qantas captain and why I didn't succeed why did he launch so successfully into life and why didn't I so I don't think I can really go through it all in this video uh, I'll try and do some of it but there's a lot of reasons one of the reasons first of all Andrew was not a perfect person he was he had some peculiarity to his personality he, he was noticeably quiet he was very quiet very very quiet Char to characterize him he was he was about as thin as I am white of course his parents were British they were from the UK and they, they I think both of them and um, yeah Andrew Andrew was kind of like um, he was very quiet and looking back on it I suspect that he had some schizoid tendencies if not completely schizoid so basically my friend was a schizoid who became a Qantas captain and he had he had noticeably uh, fast eye movements which which bespeaks fast reflexes and a fast brain if you ask me like noticeably when you when you or someone would talk to him you would notice that his eyes would dart around his eyes would make these kind of stop start movements almost like an insect's eyes like like discrete movements on off on off on off on off his eyes would move around he had very darty eyes which I think bespeaked alertness and awareness I don't think he had much anxiety as a, as a personality but he had alertness and awareness which is for a pilot you don't want an anxious pilot but you want a pilot that's alert and aware so whatever he had he had the right stuff to, to, to go all the way I mean I took him for a fly when we were 16 we flew to 10,000 feet actually <laughs> in the middle of summer we flew to, to 10,000 feet and um, you've got thermometers on the um, air intakes for the cabin air in the plane and you can pull them out and look at them and I pulled out the thermometer and looked at it and at 10,000 feet in the middle of summer it was really nice and cool up there compared to at sea level where we took off from you know and he, he'd taken me and also some of our mutual friends for a fly I remember one time we flew from Perth this is in Western Australia we flew, we flew from Perth down to Augusta not Augusta in Florida or whatever where they hold the Masters golf tournament but there's an Augusta in Western Australia in the south beautiful place actually the whole south of WA is beautiful I don't really like WA that much but this, if you're in WA the south is the place to be if you ask me because it's it's more rainfall it's more lush you've got rolling hills and stuff so we, we flew from Perth in like a Cessna 172RG or a Cessna 182 or something or a Sky f I can't remember but uh, one of the more heavier Cessna 172 varieties that has four seats and adjustable pitch propeller probably and probably a retractable undercarriage so Andrew was flying and there was me and there I think my friend Lucas came with us as well yeah he did and um, we flew where did we actually fly did we fly to Augusta once we did a couple of flights one time me and Andrew flew down to Augusta we got there basically at night time he was practicing his night flying and then we flew back to Perth at some point I think in the night time and it was a perfect flight he was he was confident and competent did everything good I remember his landing at sunset at Augusta was very good he was landing into the Sun so you couldn't see shit in front of you with the Sun glare and his landing was fucking perfect I was like 
damn, he's doing all right, you know. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so he turned out to be gay. So that's not good. So he seems to be a schizoid, and he turned out to be gay. I think nowadays, I mean, I only saw him 10 years ago, right? But I think, I don't know what he's up to now, but I think, I think 10 years ago, he was moving from his first house that he owned to, uh, he was buying a house that had a double block and they got him and his boyfriend, I gather, who was like a half Asian and also a pilot, were, were gonna, were gonna like build another house on this double block and then it's a good investment, right? So, why was he gay? If he had such a good upbringing, why was he gay? I, he must have had some childhood trauma from that, probably sexual abuse. I, I don't know. But, like, in his specific case, I don't know. But there must have been something that, that, that tampered with him, you know? Like, his bedroom had planes all over the ceiling, model, model planes all over the ceiling. And he had two brothers, and um, he had a mum and a dad. And his dad was—he said his dad was a registrar at a hospital. And I said, "What, like a doctor?" And he said, "No, no. He just greets the people as they come into the hospital." So, from what I understand, his dad was not a doctor. From what he said, his dad was actually just like some guy that that checks in. The, the new patients in the hospital. He's probably honestly he was probably like the manager of the registrars or something. But, you know, they weren't totally rich or something. And his mum, I'd met his mum I'd, I'd only sort of seen his dad once. His dad walked in the door once. I think he was wearing like business clothing and he said, "Hello boys," to to his three sons. Uh, but um I'd met his mum probably a few times and his mum seemed to have good bounce, so she's British, and she seemed to have pretty good boundaries. I remember one time we were at the tailgate of her car, and I said something about like um, I, I can't remember the context, but I said something like like I apologise if I damage your car or something like that. Maybe I was pulling something out of the car, or I was putting something in, or something, and it was an awkward thing. And she said, "Well, if she just she just said straight back to me." straight away without thinking sort of thing she just said back to me confidently well if you damage it I'll send you the bill so she had good boundaries she had good boundaries that was like well if you damage my car I'll just send you the bill so that is an expression of good boundaries so Andrew was a very quiet individual but I think he must have had good boundaries from his mum but the fact that he's a schizoid and so quiet and so not really preferring the company of people and the fact that um, the fact that he turned out to be a homosexual thank you truck for letting me through appreciate it thank you yeah Something must have gone wrong in his early life for things to be that way, you know? He probably got diddled by a family member or something. I don't know. I don't know, but something, mu something must have gone wrong in his early life for him to become a schizoid and for him to become a homosexual. So I'm not saying that he's perfect, all right? I'm not saying that my friend that I'm comparing myself to is perfect. And I'm still friends with him. I'll still, I'll still give him a call and blah, blah, blah. I never acknowledged his gayness, but it was becoming pretty obvious by the time I saw him last. Like, you know, we knew each other throughout the years. Like earlier, so that last time I saw him was 2010 in Perth. But another time when I was living in Adelaide, he came to Adelaide for some uh, simulator training or something. Like like air airline simulator training. And um, 
he came and visited me uh, at my apartment. I lived in an apartment close to the city and I had my apartment, I had my car and my girlfriend lived with me. So he came and visited me and my girlfriend and that was very pleasant and stuff and he showed us some photos of when he'd been flying up north up north as they call it in Australia in in aviation terms up north basically means when you're trying to build your hours and you're not an airline pilot yet you go up north and up north means like you know in the Northern Territory or the north of WA or the, or the north of Queensland there's like tourism operations that fly light aircraft for sightseeing and things like that and there's some jobs up there up north and so that's what you do to cut your teeth and to build your hours you go up north you do bush flying basically it's it's like you you often it's it's hard if you've got it's not for men who have families really because like you'll be staying in a hostel for like you know years at a time and shit like that like it's not very comfortable life it's not a very comfortable life it's almost like a backpacker's life but you're a pilot with a job and the job that you have you don't always get paid very much money. You might, if you're lucky, you might get paid minimum wage for your job, even though you're a highly skilled pilot with a lot of um, expense to build, to, to, to build your training up to that point. And if you fuck it up, well, don't come Monday. Like he showed me this photo of uh, a float plane, like a Cessna or something, like just say a Cessna 172, but it's got floats and it had actually tipped upside down in the water. And he, he said the guy that was flying that float plane, I said, was he fired after he crashed the, crashed the Cessna? And he said, no, he wasn't fired. But then he said um, later on he was fired or later on he left the company or something like that. So, you know, it was fairly sort of rough and ready flying. Like, you know, he showed that photo of like one Cessna with floats that had tipped over. How I started to know that he was gay is because in, in all of those photos that he was showing me, one of them was like in a bathroom. It might have been in a bathroom at a gay club or something. There was like a soap dispenser. Like you press it and the soap, liquid soap spurts out, one of those ones. And it had a, someone had stuck a sticker on the front of it that was like something sexual, like, like implying that the soap dispenser was an ejaculation and he and he'd taken a photo of that I'd never seen anything like that before it must have been in a gay club or something and and when it came up he just said oh that's a bit gross so I was starting to suspect that he was gay stuff like that so yeah um, but I don't want to dwell on on the bad stuff really but I think his IQ was a bit higher than mine. He never, he was so quiet, he never asked questions at school. At school, in like aviation class and that, he never asked questions. But he always got pretty good grades in tests and assignments and everything, and exams. His grades were consistently higher than my grades but not by too much. For example, if I would get 68% on a test, he would get 75% on that same test. That was kind of like the difference between our grades. I was a little bit less than him in terms of our grades, but you know, but not always. Things that didn't involve mathematics, I would use, I would say that I would I would sometimes get the same grades as him, or maybe even a bit higher sometimes. But things that involved mathematics, he would be consistently still getting his standard grades. He had no problem with it. Whereas me with mathematics, I really struggled. One of the guys in the class who later on became a Sorry about the noise. Who, who, one guy who later on became a navigator for the Air Force, in like year 11 in the aviation class, he was saying, he was saying about me that I was on track to be uh, to be the ducks of that year of aviation. 
because I was doing so well. I was getting A's and stuff like that. It was a nice thing that he said. He said, you know, that I was on track to being the ducks of... If you're the ducks of aviation, that's a big thing. So, but the trouble is, after, after he made that comment, then we started really with the mathematics, and that's when my grades began to drop, because I just couldn't handle the mathematics as well as I was handling all the other stuff. And I think partly that's because, you know, mum didn't give a shit about helping with me with maths. I'd never been... A lot of it's genetic, probably, but, like, I think if I was taught maths from an early age, like with tennis, if you learn tennis from an early age, you can play tennis in later life. Same with skiing. If you learn to, if you learn to ski when you're a child, you, you, you can ski really well as an adult. My early life was devoid of mathematics. If I'd really been taught by parents about mathematics when I was young, I think all of that math stuff would have been close to a breeze uh, in school, in high school. So, you know, my grades were not quite as good as my friend Andrew's grades, who became a Qantas pilot. <clears throat> the other thing, though, is that <clears throat> he had a job in school. He had a job at the supermarket at the checkout. And I think he was doing like probably three five-hour shifts a week plus the weekends if you would do shifts on the weekends through school through through like probably year 11 and year 12 so he was probably pulling in $150 plus per week from his checkout job and that was enough money to go flying every single week whereas me my now I'm getting into the meat and potatoes of it so his family structure was that he had a dad that worked as a registrar he had a mum. I just want to briefly tell you about his mum. Sorry if I run out of battery. His mum, when you walk into their house, there's shelves and like sort of bookshelves, but they've got plastic tubs on them. And the plastic tubs have got labels on them. And um, there were like tens, if not hundreds of, of plastic tubs in shelves with li plastic lids on them with labels on them. They, had a, they obviously had a label maker. They must have had a label maker and she'd gone to town with making shitloads of labels to put on these plastic tubs. All manner of things were in those plastic tubs, like sewing stuff, like, you know, I don't know, odds and ends, ne sewing needles, sewing, sewing cotton, um, I don't know, uh, cutlery, anything, anything at all. Lots of stuff was in those plastic tubs. So his mum was really sort of fastidious and organised if you look at the Bible definition of what a good wife is, his mum was probably something like the Bible definition of a good wife because she, she wasn't a, a worker, she wasn't employed, but you could tell that she was really managing the household. She had that place locked down, like she had that place under control. There were so many tubs with so many labels on them, with so much stuff in them. Everything was like a lot of detail and very organised. And... If you looked at their backyard, she had a huge veggie garden in the backyard. I assume it was hers. And um, it was a really good veggie garden. And it was well kept and it was big, extensive, and it was full of veggies. I also heard Andrew say, Andrew said to me that um, one thing they do is they enter competitions. And he'd say, oh, we won another competition today, uh, like, you know, this week or whatever. Back then in WA... You could enter a competition without uh, without giving all of your details, like you know your home address, your name, blah blah blah. You could you could just enter a competition just with minimal details back then. Whereas nowadays, if you enter a competition, generally they want to get all of your life vital statistics, your date of birth, blah blah blah. So so his mum would kind of professionally enter competitions. So she wasn't a worker as such, but she did a lot of work, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I said to him, do you, do you, do, did you guys ever win anything big? Because <clears throat> they were winning competitions all the time. Like his mum would enter competitions. Like you go to the supermarket and there's like, uh, um, you know, s slips of paper that you can take one and they're by the Milo or something. And it's a Milo competition to win, you know, win a holiday to Greece or something. I don't know. I'm just making that up. But you know what I mean? 
his mum would kind of have this interest in systematically entering competitions and he said to me yeah one time we won a Mercedes Benz and I, I was like wow uh, that's great uh, what did you do with it and he said we drove it around for a bit and then we sold it and then we, we used the money to build an extension on the house so you know she was pretty smart with all this kind of stuff she she was doing some stuff that was productive and that was bringing in that was positive bringing in income managing the veggie veggie garden had all, all the stuff in the house really fastidiously organized and so this is kind of the environment that he came from and he had two brothers and one of them was called Mike and Mike was going into computers all right so so I suspect that his IQ was a bit higher than mine. He was, all, he was also in the slightly higher mathematics class than me uh, in school. And, um, but we're in the same English class. He wasn't in the highest English class. We're in the, the second highest English class in terms of difficulty and things like that. <clears throat> I don't know if he was in calculus or intro calculus. I don't know if he was. I think he just did what's called applicable maths. Whereas I did discrete maths. So I don't think he did the highest difficulty maths in school. But yeah, so he was doing school and he was getting good grades. And then he, was, he had his supermarket checkout job. And he was making enough money each week from what I, from what I understand to go flying each week. And so it occurred to me, as I was just standing at my front door of my house the other day, cleaning my teeth, it occurred to me, holy shit, even though Andrew had rich parents, so to speak, compared to me at the time, he actually financed the bulk of his early flying training by himself as like a 17-year-old, just from his checkout job. And so his economic situation, and we're getting into it now, his economic situation was basically that his mum and dad paid the bills, gave him a place to stay, of course, gave him free food, of course, and, you know, free everything like electricity, water, shower, all this kind of stuff. So his living expenses as a, a teenager were, were, were footed by his parents. And he had the stability of a dad and a mother that were not divorced. They're together. The dad works, the mother's industrious at home and doing positive things and has good boundaries, uh, psychologically speaking. And, um, and yet he was like a, a homosexual schizoid. So that not everything was perfect, but you know, that was his family and economic background. Me, on the other hand, I had this, I didn't know what a narcissist was and I had a malignant, covert, narcissistic single mother. I'd never met my dad. And my mother was never, ever, ever saying to me, like, I'm pretty sure that Andrew got a job probably because his mum and dad would have said to him, now, you can earn some real money if you go and get a job at the supermarket. Go and put your name down at the supermarket, get a part-time job through high school. Mum never said any stuff like that to me. Mum was always, like, um, very much welfare-focused. That's why I hate welfare so much these days. I would rather starve to death than go on welfare because I've had such a bad early life dependency experience on welfare from, from my mother's influence on me, which until I started to know better, I was just going with the flow and doing, doing everything that she would do. Mum was very heavily, mum was poor back then and she was very heavily interested in welfare. She was on the single parent pension. The whole reason why she could get money from the government is because of my existence. But when I turned a certain age, probably 16, the, the single parent pension for her expired. But then, then, um, then the money gets paid directly to me instead of to her and it changes its name to Ostudy. So as a teenager in school, I was on some kind of welfare called Ostudy, which is where if you're a high school student the government will pay you money when you're over a certain age like 16 or something they'll pay you money if, if you're if you're low income if your parents are low income so I went by default onto um, onto welfare it was basically like my mum's income basically got given to me 
and then my mum had to do something else to get income and that's when she started to be like a new age healer and stuff like that and like a clairvoyant and she would make money from this but she was I think she was yeah so so her single parent pension basically was given to me at the age of 16 with a different name the name of Oz study and so by default I became this welfare recipient and looking back on it I feel like I'm sort of disgusted by that so here's Andrew with mum and dad and dad works and mum mum also brings in income and um, here's my mum I don't have a dad and I've got a mum who's on welfare and who is a narcissist so that the economic foundation of our lives couldn't have been more different I also had a welfare dependence mentality my mentality was money comes from other people giving it to you you don't earn it yourself my idea was that once I'd done all of my training all of my school and university and everything then I would get a, a really high up job and that would be when I'd be earning money whereas Andrew's idea was from the age of like 16 or 17 he was going to work in a lowly job as a checkout operator at Coles supermarket and um, that is a real shit eating job you got to eat shit when you do that job that's a low status job but he was just doing it without complaint and he was from what I understand he was good at it like you know he didn't have blues with the boss didn't have run-ins with the management he seemed to always be able to fit the whole schedule together he had skills that I just didn't have like he had a skill to to do scheduling at work to fit work and study and exams of high school and then later on of university to fit all those things together later on when I was in university and I tried doing this I tried having a supermarket job and I tried doing university I found that I was failing my courses and I'd done things a bit silly like I'd started work in a supermarket that was near the university but that was across the other side of the city whereas Andrew had a where they lived the suburb where they lived the supermarket was in that same suburb so he had a very short journey to his job he just he just had really basic little life skills that were so valuable that I just didn't have that I just didn't have and somehow he was able to successfully manage high school studying and getting good enough grades with with also scheduling successfully a supermarket job without pissing off the supermarket managers and without failing his school grades and on top of that he was able to start flying flying is like a second a third job there so he had like three jobs he had flying studying and flying for flying is a job it's study but it's it's work it's work that you do that's unpaid it's very critical work that you have to get it right it's safety critical so he was doing three three jobs he was high school is a big deal he was doing high school and getting good enough grades he was doing flying training just about every week he'd go for a fly like he was one of the earliest guys in the class in the aviation class to get his PPL which is private pilot license he was one of the earliest ones he just did it quietly quietly consistently flying often and you know I, I he got a bit of help from his parents with with the cost but I got the feeling that a lot of the the penny drop moment for me just about a day or two ago or three days ago cleaning my teeth at the front door of my house I was like holy shit from his supermarket job as a checkout cashier he funded the bulk of his early flying training from that like I think he basically funded most of his PPL from his supermarket job while he was in high school and then if you compare and contrast that mentality to my welfare dependence mentality from my malignant narcissist mother not even to, to mention to say nothing of the severe cystic acne that were the pustules that were overflowing like volcanoes on my face and neck and back and and thighs and everywhere on my body my 
my arms, my legs, my my chest, just just volcano, or volcanic eruptions of pus and blood from all this toxic release from being associated, being in proximity to a malignant narcissist, my mother. Like the the conditions that we we're under were different, and the things that he was taught by his parents and that he learned was so very different than what I was taught. What I was taught was normal, was a different normal than what he was taught was normal. For him it was normal to go and get a job. So in in high school, he did school. School, school is hard to do. Then he did a job. He, he held down the job without getting fired. And on top of that, he did flying training. What did I do in high school? In high school, I did high school and I tried to do flying training on the strength of my welfare money and I tried to organize money through like my inheritance that was supposed to be coming in and things like that but because I had a malignant narcissist mother I never really got any of my inheritance until years later and even then it wasn't very much so my inheritance was not available to me in those early years when I was trying to do flying I was doing high school and I thought to myself as well, if I get a job, I'm going to lose focus on high school and I'll, my grades will suffer and then I won't get into the Air Force. That was my thinking. My thinking was to put all of my focus and energy into getting good grades in school. And I felt that I was at capacity with what I was doing in school. And I felt that if I tried to divert my focus and attention elsewhere, that I was going to, to, to flunk school, that I was going to fail school. And this is where IQ and capacity come in. Andrew's IQ was a bit higher than mine. And I, I don't know, but I suspect, I, at the time I suspected that his capacity was probably three times what my capacity was. But looking back on it, I'm not so sure about that. I think possibly I could have done as good as him in terms of having a job, doing flying training once a week and doing high school. I probably could have done that. And that's what that's what's really interesting. That's what makes me think, well, if I probably could have done that if I didn't have a narcissistic condition at home, which I don't have now, if I could have done that just like him, why don't I use him as a template for successful launching at age 18 into adulthood and why don't I relaunch my 18 year old self now at the age of 42 like I should have done back then if I knew how to do it back then I would have done it upon reflection I can see what he did and how it worked and everything why don't I just why don't I just copy him in in his mode of launching into adulthood why don't I just do that now myself That's a profound thing, right? We're at one hour and eight minutes. In other words, why don't, this year, 2024, why don't I have a relaunch into adulthood? I've been away from the community for two years, doing all this inner work, doing all this shadow work, working on my shadow, working on my unconscious and my subconscious to get, get my conscious in touch with my unconscious, to get doing inner child work, getting in touch with my inner child saving my inner child from the box that he was kept in all this time. I'd taken Andrew for flying on a number of occasions. One time in year 12, and look, he said to me, you know, we caught up after school, like when we were both in uni, but maybe I'd just quit uni or something. He stopped by my mum's place where I was living at the time in his in his hand-me-down car from his grandparents and he'd arrived in a like a white shirt and black pants very thin no fat on him from his his checkout operator job at Coles supermarket and um, he'd taken his badge off and shit but you know he's in his Coles clothing and uh, we sort of caught up you know like probably in what would have been the third year of university or something or maybe university was finished I'm not sure but we, we sort of caught up and I remember we we're standing in the front garden of my mum's house 
and he said to me I don't see any problem just continue flying is what he said to me so that that was like when we were both probably like 20 years old or something we'd been out of school for about two years rewind back to year 12 we're both we're both like 18 years old and we're in the English class in year 12 and I said to him you know it's a nice day wouldn't it be a nice day to go for a fly <laughs> And he said, yeah, it would. And I said, well, well, let's go to the airport and let's go flying. So as teenagers in year 12, the school had a plane. Uh, I rang up the airport and I said, is such and such available, the plane? And the, the receptionist said, yeah, it's, it's available. And I said, can I book it out for such and such today? She said, yeah, sure. So I, I, I had a motorbike back then. I drove my motorbike and Andrew drove his car and we both went down to the airport and um, I checked out the plane and I took Andrew for a fly and we went for a fly we're like 18 years old uh, we went for a fly and that's how you know instead of being in the English class in year 12 it's just like do you want to go for a fly it's a pretty nice day let's go for a fly <laughs> and of course I was the pilot in command there's two seats and there's two controls there's only one pilot though and that was me so it's not like I was always like a passenger no I was the pilot on that instance flying someone who would later on become a future Qantas captain so you can kind of get a feel now for the tragedy I don't, I don't want to be like a victim and stuff but that is my life the tragedy that is my life like I I started off with some fucking narcissism man it destroys people it absolutely destroys people if people wonder why I'm so vehemently opposed to organizations supporting narcissists at the expense of truth tellers it's because I have firsthand experienced the destruction that narcissists wreak on people's lives especially their children Another time, my brother and sister came over from, from um, they, were, they were from interstate, they came over, they traveled a long way, I took them both for a fly, one after the other. Uh, my friend came over from, from, uh, from Adelaide, and we were doing some scuba diving and stuff, this is after high school had finished. We were doing some scuba diving at the beaches off, off Perth, off the coast of Perth. And um, I took him for a fly and I took him to do some aerobatics and we did some aerobatics. And afterwards he was like, that was awesome. So. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to get ahead. I don't want to get ahead of myself, and I don't want to make promises on camera that I can't keep. But a kind of a, an I, you know, I don't want to just say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that," and then not do it, because I'm I'm struggling against like apathy and learned helplessness and all this kind of stuff. And it has to be said, a a, a foundation beginning of welfare dependency. Uh, in in all of this historical context I'm really seriously thinking well I've been away from society for two years doing this inner work this shadow work this inner child work now it's time to go back into society how do I do it how do I take steps to go back into society how do I do it and it, and it just occurred to me that this is very similar to, to 18 year old 18 year old young man launching into life and then I was like, well, Andrew la launched into life successfully. He did three things at once, flying, supermarket job, and high school, and then later on university. Maybe I could do something similar. It doesn't have to be a flying route. I don't have to fly at all. But just his model of self-sufficiency and pretty bloody high workload of, of many things at once he got ahead like over the years I could see the progress that he was making like he'd steadily show up in better cars and steadily he'd get a house and get his own house and
steadily he'd get better and better flying jobs. Like uh, one of his first flying jobs, when I think when we were in university, was at a skydiving place. He was the pilot of the skydiving plane. And I went down there and I visited the place with him like he sort of invited me to go and have a look at this place where he, where he was working and they were only paying him I think like fuel money they'd pay him a bit of money for fuel to get there and get back because it was a long way and uh, one of the bosses down there said to me we can get you a flying job basically he said that to me and he didn't really realize that I'd been out of flying for for so long then I'd kind of stopped but it was it was kind of him to say that it was kind of Andrew to kind of hook me up with that connection as well. So this was a schizoid, but this was like a pretty good friend of mine, you know. It, it helped me out and stuff um, with those kind of connections. He had, he had another job as well that was at the airport working for a rental car company cleaning cars. And he said to me it was pretty good half the time they're sitting around watching television because there wasn't much to do. And he was getting paid pretty good money at the time, I don't know, 20, 20, 25 bucks an hour sometimes, things like that. That was a long time ago as well. So, and he got his career going without doing any instructing. He didn't become an instructor, which is, that's a, that's a pretty good thing. Like, a lot of people become an instructor to get their career going. He never became an instructor. I, I didn't really want to be an instructor myself. He was sort of doing different flying work. Like I said, like the skydiving and things like that. One time, me, Andrew, and my friend Lucas in university, because we're all in the same class in university doing aviation, we went for a fly down south in WA. So we flew from, per I was telling you about this earlier, we flew from Perth to like Augusta or somewhere, and we landed, I think we got fish and chips, and um, then we were flying back sort of in the afternoon, and a cold front started coming through. So this big wave of cloud, and he was a VFR pilot, which means he's not allowed to fly in the cloud. So, as this cold front's coming through with rain and cloud, him and Lucas was, were sitting in the front and they both had headsets. I was in the back and I didn't have a headset, so I couldn't hear what they were saying and I couldn't talk to them. But it was, it was almost an emergency. He tried climbing higher to get away from the cold front. He tried climbing to 8,000 feet, but that didn't do anything. Up at 8,000 feet, there's still the cold front there. It's this big band of cloud that comes through and brings rain and darkness with it. So we were halfway back from Augusta to Perth, near, um, near the airport called Serpentine, which is south of Jandicott Airport. And um, he, just, he decided to divert to Serpentine and to put, to, to put down there and so this is a funny story. So we, we, di we diverted to Serpentine and landed at Serpentine. And it was a pretty close run thing. We, we came in and landed. And as we were landing at Serpentine, just before or just after us, a twin-engined aircraft also came in and landed. And it landed in the opposite direction on the same runway as what we'd landed on. It was kind of a getting towards an emergency thing like planes that were VFR needed to put down now in that region because of this fucking cold front coming through so it was like we landed and as soon as we'd landed this fucking twin comes in and lands on the same runway but in the different direction so it was kind of like there's the runway put her down sort of thing and so we landed at Serpentine just before dark and we didn't know what to expect. Like we would, I was just thinking, all right, we're we're at, we're at Serpentine, great. And it turns out that a whole bunch of guys that we knew from university were at Serpentine at that exact moment, having a fucking barbecue. <laughs> Our friend from university, Simon, Simon was down there with a can of coke and a, and a, a 
a sausage in bread with tomato sauce and we just landed and we rock up, we park the plane, we get out, me, Lucas and Andrew get out. People that say that I don't have friends, I had friends. We get out of the plane and we walk over to one of the hangars where something's going on and there's an instructor on duty there that's like one of the older students from, from our aviation course at university. He's like a grade three instructor now. And he said to Andrew, well, what did you learn from that? And Andrew said, uh, don't do stupid things. And so that, that's what he said. And um, there was a barbecue on there. So that grade three was there. Simon was there from, from our, our class at university. And he was like, oh, hey, good to see you guys here. <laughs> Didn't expect to see you guys here. <laughs> it, it, was, it was like we'd just arrived fashionably late for a barbecue. <laughs> But really, we were escaping for our lives from a cold front. So we had something to eat. And then we went and stayed at Simon's parents' place. We stayed the night there. And then in the morning, when the cold front had gone through, they usually go through in about six hours, unless another one comes through. In the morning, uh, Simon or his, or, or his, yeah, Simon drove us to back to the airport. We jumped in the plane and we kept on going and we went back to Perth. So that was an interesting story, wasn't it? So... I was also heavily relying on the military to take me as a pilot and they didn't. And I also tried out for the Qantas cadetship and they didn't take me. So I was kind of... I was... I was devastated by the military rejecting me. I was devastated. I'd kind of like put all my hopes and dreams in that. And when they so badly rejected me, I was fucking devastated. Devastated. Whereas Andrew never tried out for the military. One of the big lessons I'm learning is that if you if you have a stable foundation upbringing, childhood, teenagehood, then you can launch into life with some success. You can sustain hard work in jobs and other things for a prolonged period without burning out. He didn't burn out. He was a machine, he didn't burn out. Whereas me, I would burn out. And I would burn out because of the because of the codependency. Because of the people pleasing nature of my early childhood programming, I would burn out. He wouldn't burn out. So I'm gonna have to do the inner work on myself so that I can sustain being in a employment or whatever without burning out. Otherwise it's hopeless. And can I do it? Uh maybe I don't see why not but it's going to take probably a few years of getting in the stride of things of, of having boundaries basically the difference between my friend Andrew and this other guy that I knew that, that got into the Qantas cadetship at like age 18 the difference their, their personalities were totally different totally different it just goes to show that there's no one person that is an airline pilot. There's all different people that are airline pilots. All different people. And it occurs to me, well, if there's all different people that are airline pilots, why not me? Why not me? It's, it is kind of a thing that if you do the training and if, if you pass the check rides and the, and the exams, if you get the qualifications, if you're qualified, then you're qualified. The other big thing, and I'll end this video soon, we're almost in town, one, one hour, 24 minutes. The other big thing is that mum being a narcissist, the, the, the unstated rule, the hidden, the hidden rule of narcissistic parents is the child can never be better than the parent. The child is supposed to be kept down and, and by keeping them down, 
the, the parent keeps the child close to the parent. By sabotaging the child, the child is forced to be reliant, dependent on the parent who is a narcissist. That's why the parent will try their hardest to sabotage the child so that the child cannot become independent. So when I was trying to launch into adulthood, I had this malignant, narcissistic, covert narcissist mother, single mother, who was trying her hardest to sabotage me so that I couldn't launch into society so that I would be forced to be dependent on her. I used to say things earlier in life like I used to say, mum is my only friend. My mum is my only true friend. I would say things like that. Me and mum are very close. I would say things like that. Mum is my only true friend. She's the only one that doesn't abandon me. That was kind of like how I was thinking. Looking back on it, that's how she wanted it. She always wanted me to be a victim. She was always ready with, there, there, it's all right. You failed again in life, it's all right. I'm always here for you. And then she would do stupid shit to just destroy me. And it was like, fuck, what is going on here? And she would in in inculcate into my psyche this idea of learned helplessness that I can't win, I can't succeed. It's not even worth trying because I just can't succeed. I just keep failing. Everything I try, I fail. This is, this is what they engender in your mindset, these narcissistic, malignant, covert narcissist parents. And it's not actually true. As I started to get away from her, particularly in my 30s, I started to realize, oh my God, I can solve any problem. Oh my God, I have good luck. At some point in my 30s, I realized that I had good luck. And what it really was, is it was the absence of narcissism in my life. And I started to win. And the, the harder I worked, the more I won. Hard work tends to get you places. I worked hard, I had friends that worked hard, we'd play golf in our downtime. I was starting to win, I was starting to get mortgages, I was starting to get real estate and property and brand new cars and shit like that. I couldn't believe it. Like what, looking back on it, that was what's the difference between getting away from a narcissist I was actually staying with my grandparents at the time because I'd been forced to leave uh, my mother's house prematurely before. I was getting ready to launch back then. I wanted to use my degree and get a professional job. And as I was starting to get successful at the supermarket that I was working at at Safeway, which is, which is Woolworths, mum was seeing that I was becoming successful in that job and that I was bonding with the guys at the, in the team, including the manager of, of the team. And she saw that. She saw how successful I'd become after uh, about 10 months of work there. And then she fucking uh, sabotaged me. I'm not going to go into it now, but she, she sabotaged me extremely badly and, f and made up a lot of shit about me and told it to a lot of people. And that forced me to leave her house earlier than I'd wanted to. I was on track to get a professional job, go from the supermarket job to the professional job. She could see that I was on track and she stepped in. She was like, ah, he's having success. Sabotage. And it was so disruptive to my life. It was like a, tr a goods train being derailed. Shit everywhere, ransacked, pulverized, destroyed, messed up, everything overturned and spilt. My life was like a goods train that had, that had been derailed thanks to her, thanks to that. So I ended up saying to my grandparents, look, can I come and stay with you? That was in a different state. And I went and stayed with my, my dad's parents, my grandparents, the, my dad's parents, not my mum's. My mum's parents were both dead by then. So I went and stayed with my dad's parents, and my dad was dead, of course. And so at my dad's parents' place, my grandparents' place, with you know extended family popping in all the time, aunties, uncles, myriad of cousins, and um, some of them, some of my cousins were starting to have their own babies and children and stuff. Family friends popping by. The whole place was devoid of narcissism and it was stability personified. And I got a job straight away. I had good luck with that at, at working for, for Woolworths again. And I just had such stability when I was there. And after a, it was so hard at first. At first I was walking to work. Then I had a $50 uh, Big W bicycle. I had a $50 bicycle to get to and from work. 
and the neighbours of my grandparents, who was a who was a dentist, um, can't remember his name, but my grandma said to me that he said this dentist neighbour of theirs, like he was rich, he had a swimming pool in the backyard and everything. Whenever I'd walk past his place, apparently he'd seen me sometimes, and he's, he'd commented to my grandma, "That young man has the weight of the world on his shoulders," because I, I must have looked like I was so intense. And I was really trying to bootstrap, I was bootstrapping myself then, I was pulling myself up. That was really my launch and it was, it was assisted by getting away from my mum, the narcissist, and just staying at my grandparents' place was sort of similar to when, a when Andrew was 17 at his parents' place, launching into life like that. I had such stability there, nobody was trying to sabotage me there, and I went from strength to strength. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was succeeding. Every time I succeeded, I was incredibly surprised. I was like, uh, I was, you've heard of the saying, waiting for the shoe to drop? Waiting for the other shoe to drop? You've heard of that saying? It, it originates from like apartment building, living in apartments, maybe in, in, in like the 20s and 30s when the apartment, uh, the floor was thin and any, any footsteps on the floor above, you could hear them on your, on your ceiling in your apartment. Waiting for the other, sh other shoe to drop means you hear one sh person take off one shoe and, and drop it on the floor, you can expect that they're gonna take off the other shoe and drop it on the floor. It's waiting for the other shoe to drop. With narcissism context, waiting for the other shoe to drop means you just have this feeling that something bad is going to happen. Waiting for the other shoe to drop. You just have a feeling that if you have some some smoothness and some stability in your life pretty soon a narcissist is going to fuck it up for you they, they're gonna they're gonna do something to destroy your success they're going to do something to sabotage your success if you're having any small amount of success they're incredibly sensitive to it they'll pick up on it and they'll sabotage it waiting for the other shoe to drop you just know it's coming so all through staying at my grandparents place and then getting my own my own place i was waiting for the other shoe to drop and the amazing thing is that just nothing happened. Like it was just a life devoid of narcissistic abuse. It was so effing amazing. I just can't even believe it. Like it was one of the biggest revelations to me in my life, although it was slow to dawn on me because it's a process over many years, that, that it's just like, my God, it's a breath of fresh air here. Nobody's trying to sabotage me. I ca they're not perfect people, but I'm, my God, I can't believe it. Like. They're not trying to sabotage me. I, I didn't even realize that mum was trying to sabotage me until I, I got away from her. And then I was like, hey, I don't have this constant low level cortisol feeling that I grew up with. Uh, why, why is that? Slowly, slowly it dawned on me that um, I didn't even realize that it was basically subconscious, but mum had been sabotaging me my whole damn life. Oh God. And, tr and it, it, for, the re for one of the reasons of sadistic supply, but for the other reason of keeping me close to her, if I'm constantly failing in life, then I'm more likely to be like a nurse to her as she gets older. That was her secret plan, and I foiled her plan. It didn't work on me. So under all of these cortisol conditions, you can kind of see why at the age of 18, I failed to launch into life when when otherwise it could have been different i could have launched into a career as a, as a pilot so so that's why now i'll finish the video about now but i'm desperately trying to build up this healthy narcissism side of my personality desperately trying because it's because it's it's not life and death but it's, it's it kind of is it's just so necessary for, for one's survival once you've left the narcissist, they've left you with a whole lot of programming that is still there like a ghost to haunt you that if you can't address the programming and neutralize it, you're still going to be stuck with it. And um, it'll keep sabotaging you long after the narcissist is out of your life. So. You need to get rid of that self-sabotage, which means building up the, the, the compressed and absent side of your personality, the whole half of you that's missing, uh, which, uh, which, is about, um, which is about boundaries and it's about sticking up for yourself and, and uh, basically not burning out in a work or study environment from interaction with others where you're always people-pleasing. 
people pleasing results in burnout and burnout is catastrophic i'm not i'm i'm a normal person i'm not i don't have a personality disorder i don't have autism or anything like that as well one of the things of, of autistic people for example just to give you an idea of, of it's what i'm saying is it's like i'm disabled just like a really severely disabled person yet i'm not disabled like for example i would burn out from being a people pleaser other people burn out for much more serious reasons that they can't really they can't really change well i, I can change being a people pleaser god it's hot 37 down here today my god 37 Definitely need that aircon. I'm getting it on Thursday, so that's great. Autists will burn out. Autists will burn out because they don't know how to be um, body language and um, interpersonal communication skills. They just know facts and data. They can't read facial expressions. A lot of them can't even recognize their own parents' faces. Shit like that. They're face blind. Stuff like that. So... They have to do scripting to know how to do small talk. Ah, oh, hi. Oh, it's good weather today, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's lovely weather. Autists can't do that unless they pre-script it. They have, to, they have to consciously learn how to engage in small talk because they can't do it just intuitively like a normal neurotypical human can. So the, the intense focus, uh, consciousness effort for an autist to just, be, to, to just pretend to be normal that conscious effort is like they're using up 80% of their CPU at all times just to try and act normal. That effort over time in the workplace or wherever, study, but mostly the workplace, burns them the F out. They burn out from that 80% of their CPU being used to just, to just act normal. Autists will burn out from trying to act like a neurotypical when they're not a neurotypical from trying to suppress their stimming. If they weren't suppressing their stimming in the workplace, they'd be running around the room, flapping their hands like this, making noises. That's what an autist does when they're not masking, when they're not pretending to be neurotypical. And of course, that's not acceptable to neurotypicals, so they don't do it. They suppress it, they mask it. The conscious effort that it takes them to do that, over time, it burns them out. So autists burn out from trying to act like a neurotypical. I was burning out from being a people pleaser. So obviously if you've got some reason that's causing you to burn out, if you can learn to address it so that it's not, so it's not a problem anymore it's, or it's, it's mitigated, lessened, maybe you won't burn out. Maybe you'll be able to have a sustainable career. It's possible, people do it, people do it all the time. People have sustainable careers all the time where they don't burn out. I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I'm, an, I'm as neurotypical as they come. So I don't have this permanent disability that's stopping me from progressing in terms of autists are always burning out. Other people burn out for other reasons. Me, why was I bur burning out? Because I was a people pleaser. I couldn't say no. I couldn't say no. The boss would say, oh, we need you to do this shift. Okay. We need you to do that shift. Okay. Doesn't matter that I hadn't had any sleep in 48 hours. I'd just go and do the shift constantly people pleasing i just saying yes to everybody never never pushing back never saying no to someone uh, it was like everybody's your boss in the work environment anybody at all can come and tell you to do something and you'll do it and in that environment like you're not respecting yourself you'll burn out you'll burn out you'll burn out so you need, I need some way of being sustainable in the work environment so that I won't